Hello, everybody. Hello. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jean Shaheen. I'm the director of the forum, and I am delighted this evening to welcome you all to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm actually the director of the Institute of Politics. 
In hosting tonight's forum, the Institute of Politics is pleased to partner with Professor Jerry Meckling and the Kennedy School's e-government initiative. Now, as a former governor, it's always exciting to be able to welcome another governor to the forum. And this evening, our guest is one of the most dynamic, the most innovative governors in the entire country, and she just happens to be a woman, which is particularly exciting. Obviously, our guest is Michigan's Governor Jennifer Granholm. It's fitting that given the governor's commitment to education, and especially higher education, that we should have a student here tonight to introduce the governor. Brittany Morosky is a freshman at Harvard College, and she's from Bark River, Michigan. She's a member of the Institute of Politics Student Survey Project. I'll give you my little commercial here since I've got you all. Um, the IOP conducts a biannual survey of student voter attitudes about political engagement. And we are actually going to be discussing this survey with several national pollsters on Wednesday night in the forum at 6 p.m. So if you don't have plans for Wednesday, you should plan to join us. Now I would like to turn the podium over to Brittany for our introduction. Brittany. Thank you, Governor Shaheen. It is my honor to introduce my governor, Jennifer Granholm, from the great state of Michigan. The first in her family to attend college, she is a graduate from UC Berkeley and Harvard Law School and is a married mother of three children. Governor Granholm was elected the 47th governor of Michigan in 2002. During her three years as governor, she has successfully handled a $4 billion budget deficit place special emphasis on growing Michigan's economy, and focus on improving the state's quality of life. Her initiatives have led to the creation of 130,000 jobs, and her health care initiatives have resulted in expanded coverage for 300,000 uninsured Michiganians. She has also introduced the nation's first bulk buying pool for prescription drugs, saving the state nearly $40 million and, is, and has enrolled nearly 50,000 additional children for health insurance through the state's Healthy Kids and My Child programs. In her powerful remarks at Rosa Parks' funeral in Detroit last week, the governor spoke passionately about continuing the fight for civil rights until, as she stated, the city of Bloomfield Hills and the city of Detroit have the same college graduation rates. Newsweek calls Governor Granholm smart and well-grounded with a no-nonsense style, and the fact that she was born in Canada has led some to call for a constitutional amendment to permit national, naturalized citizens to run for president. <laughs> Can you imagine Granholm versus Schwarzenegger in 2008? This past August, I saw Governor Granholm when she visited the Upper Peninsula State Fair in Michigan. I watched her interact with people from my community as she walked to the beef barn to congratulate the teenage owner of the Grand Champion Steer. My community appreciated her willingness to travel from Lansing to the Upper Peninsula to taste our funnel cakes, judge our livestock, but most importantly, experience the rural way of life. For her hard work on behalf of all Michiganians and for her future promise, please join me in welcoming Governor Jennifer Granholm to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Thank you. <laughs> now, Brittany, of course, being from the UP, for those of you who, I gotta go back to the mics here for a second. For those of you who know Michigan, you know, our, the lower peninsula is a, a, a hand, right? The upper peninsula is two. Although, what Brittany, Brittany comes from, what we call the banana belt of the upper peninsula. And uh, in fact, Brittany, I didn't tell you this in the back, but 
Um, the UP is known for a lot of things, but one of the things that the Upper Peninsula is known for is that it is, in fact, the, can you hear me? It is, in fact, uh, a precursor to the Iditarod. The UP 200 is a part of the sled dog race that is the Iditarod. And so um, I was actually in the UP 200. I was the dead weight in the first sled. <laughs> So they Velcroed me in on some dead, on some frozen fish, you know. They Velcroed me in the sled and the mush, the dogs are in front of me. And I'm going by the grandstand. This just gives you a flavor of the UP. Uh, it's so fabulous. I'm going by the grandstand. And the woman who is the announcer who's yelling, you know, this is so-and-so is going by and their sled dog team, blah, 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 blah. And there I am uh, Velcroed in with my my glasses on and she says, ah, oh, there's Governor Granholm going by. Governor Granholm, nice to see you. You're about to go around dead man's curve. <laughs> and then she says, and remember, youper chicks don't cry till the bone pokes through. See you later. <laughs> so we know that Brittany's tough <laughs> as a youper chick. <laughs> and speaking of chicks, girl. <laughs> I'm so pleased to be able to follow in the footsteps as governor of another groundbreaker, Jean Shaheen, of course. Many of us, the women governors or the chicks in charge, as we like to call ourselves, really do look to those who went before us as great mentors. And Jean Shaheen is one of them. You're so fortunate here at Harvard to, to have her here as director now. And um, I no doubt we'll uh, see a lot of other Michigan um, people coming to this forum like Debbie Stabenow did a few uh, couple was it a couple weeks ago so glad to have you here glad to be able to hear, be here as well to speak about the subject that is really so near and dear to my heart which is the question of change now let me just set the stage for you because Michigan as a state is sort of the poster child for the deindustrialization of America Michigan has been the state that is most impacted by globalization. And when I say that, of course, Michigan, as many of you know, is the automotive capital of the world, and proudly so. And our domestic automobile industry has been going through some significant challenges, as many of you are probably aware. And so we have the largest percentage of our state economy tied to manufacturing. Consequently, the impact of globalization on our state is greater than perhaps any other state in the country. So this, as in think about yourself in this position, what you would do if you were governor of a state that is going through massive change and enormous pain on the ground for people that have worked for decades at companies and find themselves, boom, without a job. So let me just give you an example. I brought you, I brought, just as a, an exhibit, the newspaper from yesterday. And on the front, the headlines here, it says, how Black October, how one month changed the course of the auto industry. And the scions of the auto industry are shown on the front, or at least some of them. Rick Wagner at the top. Uh, Steve, Rick Wagner, of course, the chairman and CEO of, of General Motors. The next person down is Steve Miller, who has taken over Delphi, which is a tier one supplier to the automotive industry that has just declared bankruptcy. Um, and then on the way down, Kirk Kerkorian, who uh, may be involved in some aspect of GM's restructuring, and Ron Gettelfinger, who's head of the UAW. Now, the reason why it's called Black October is because of Delphi's declaring bankruptcy. But Delphi, because it was the largest bankruptcy in Michigan history, the 13th largest bankruptcy in the United States, as you can imagine, this major employer in Michigan when it declares bankruptcy and the thousands of people who work for Delphi are thrown into turmoil, and then there are a lot of businesses that supply Delphi that are thrown into turmoil. And of course, Delphi supplies GM, which was thrown into turmoil. So we have this enormous um, cataclysm that is represented by Delphi, but that's not the only issue. Delphi has followed on the heels of 
Collins and Aikman, another supplier that, was that had declared bankruptcy. Tower Automotive had declared bankruptcy. All of these firms that are struggling with the competitiveness issues of a global economy. So the question for me as governor is what do you do in a state that has been so proud of this automotive heritage, knowing that as a product, the car is not gonna go away. I mean, you all, if you don't have cars yet, you sure as heck are gonna. And there is a new car owner in America being born every 12 seconds. There's new car owners being made, even as we speak, at 6.15 at night somewhere. Uh, and so the question is, how do we take advantage of that opportunity, knowing that it is going to be a restructuring that the state has to go through? So we have, this is the way I have phrased it to our Michigan citizens, is that we have essentially two economies in Michigan. We have a manufacturing economy, which has been the largest part of our economy. And then we have a nascent tech economy, an economy that is growing in other areas that we know we can be competitive in. And so as governor, I got to focus on keeping what we've got in the automotive industry and growing other areas. Let me tell you what I have uh, put on the table, because I know I only have uh, 15 probably minutes now to speak, and then we're going to do some question and answer. But let me just tell you five things that I'm doing right now to move from from today to tomorrow. We need to create jobs today in Michigan. We have, for example, a tax structure, a business tax structure, that was developed in 1975, before we even knew what the words globalization or outsourcing meant. And, and truly, in 1975, what we decided to do in Michigan was to tax the things that can move, like uh, disproportionately small businesses, or manufacturers. So I have asked our state legislature to restructure the business taxes to make us competitive, number one. Number two, we've got to create jobs today to kick us into gear. So think, uh, you know, think of what you would do to get people working today. So one of the things that we desperately need is to gin up our infrastructure in the state of Michigan. We have a lot of room to be able to borrow in our state because we have a very low per capita debt. In fact, Governing Magazine earlier this year had Michigan ranked as tied for the third best managed state in the nation because we have a low per capita debt and because Michigan happens to have an excellent CEO. And so, <laughs> So because we've got a lot of room to move, we want to be able to take advantage of that. And so we're going to put, we have, a, we have just hundreds of infrastructure projects that have been on the books between now and 10 years from now. So we want to move those 10 years of infrastructure projects that are all necessary and planned into the next three years. Accelerate them. Put people to work today on necessary projects, rebuilding roads and bridges and older schools, making sure that we've got polluted sites cleaned up. Put 40,000 people to work each year over the next three years in cleaning up our state, improving our curb appeal, and and making sure, in fact, that we uh, have good roads and bridges. So that's the second thing I've asked the legislature to do. That puts people to work today, but those are not permanent jobs, right? So you have to restructure an economy to create permanent jobs also. But in the meantime, we have this generation of workers. Where's Brandon Hoffmeister? Where are you, Brandon? Brandon. Do you mind me talking about your dad for a second as an example? Brandon's a Harvard Law School graduate who works with me in the governor's office, and his dad works in Saginaw at a Delphi plant and has been there for 29 years. 29 years. Just shy of that 30-year pension retirement. And he learns that Delphi declares bankruptcy. You know, and here's somebody who's been hanging on for 29 years on the promise that he would be given a pension, right? Well, Brandon's dad is just one example of thousands of Americans who find themselves in this position of having their jobs outsourced or downsized or whatever. And the question is for all of us, question for you as you move into positions of leadership is what do you do with that generation of workers that has been impacted so negatively by globalization? And, and uh, truly, we have got to find a solution to that generation. And here's what I'm doing in Michigan although I think we need um, a federal Marshall Plan on this, frankly. But 
in Michigan, what we've done is divided our state into 13 regions, 13 regional skills alliances. And in those 13 regions, which are part, we have created partnerships with our Michigan Works agencies, which is our workforce development agencies, our community colleges, our higher, ed higher education institutions, and the local economic development arm or Chamber of Commerce. And what we've done in those 13 areas is canvas the realm of every employer and say, how many vacancies do you have today? And how many do you project that you will have? in the future. And you know what we've learned in that? We started this canvas in May. We've learned that in Michigan today, now we have a 6.4% unemployment rate, which is the second highest in the nation. But despite having a 6.4% unemployment rate, we have 90,000 vacancies. 90,000. Now what do you think those vacancies are in? What would you guess? Any ideas? Pardon? Not quite high tech. Healthcare, healthcare is huge, and somebody else I think said skilled, skilled trades is actually where the next uh, area of need is. And when I say skilled trades, I'm talking about people who need certifications to do a trade, like an electrician or an auto mechanic or a welder. And so what we we've got a skills gap. We've got all of these vacancies and all of this unemployment. And so what we are doing is taking people who are collecting unemployment, putting them through short-term training, getting them certified on the back end and placing them into one of the vacancies that exist today, even if the vacancies, for example, in healthcare, there's a lot of entry-level vacancies for phlebotomists. I know you may not want to be a phlebotomist, <laughs> you're maybe afraid of blood, but it's an entry-level position for you can go up to be a nurse, you can be a medical technician, radiology tech, et cetera. It is a starting point. So the question is, how do we as a nation grapple with that? Everybody can create regional skills alliances and match people, but the bottom line is that training piece needs to be met. And we are doing it with the best we can, but that's a critical national issue that we need to address. Fourth, in Michigan, in Michigan, we have, we are, um, we have a huge opportunity because in the Great Migration North, people came to Michigan for the $5 a day job, right? People came to Michigan because you didn't have to have a college degree to get a great job with great benefits. You could go right from a high school graduation line to a factory line and be taken care of. And that's been in people's DNA for generations. And so the question is, for us, how do you change people's paradigm? How do you tell parents that what was good for you is not going to be good for your son or daughter? It is a different world. And as I was saying to a group before this, I keep holding up, if any of you have read, and I highly encourage you to read, Tom Friedman's uh, book, uh, which is The World is Flat, A Brief History of the 21st Century. Any of you heard of that? Some of you have. You notice the subtitle, A Brief History of the 21st century. So just talking about five years and how dramatically the world has changed and what his whole point is that globalization is here. It's like gravity. It's not going to go away. The question is how we respond as a nation and for Michigan how we respond as a state. And so we as a consequence of our opportunity in the last century which was that you could come to Michigan without a college degree. That was an opportunity for us. That's our challenge right now. And so we have the bottom, we are in the bottom third of states with respect to the number of adults with a college degree. So what we have stated out there and put out there publicly as a goal is that we are going to double the number of college graduates in Michigan over the next 10 years. Double. And so in, in, in fulfillment of this, what I have asked the legislature to do is that I want to give every child in Michigan a $4,000 scholarship to college, regardless of whether they've passed a standardized test or not, regardless of what their grade point average is. $4,000, I know, doesn't get you squat at Harvard, but it does get you at least the equivalent of two years of a community college degree in Michigan and many of your states. We would be essentially the first state in the nation to pay for the first two years of a community college tuition, even though you could use that $4,000 anywhere, uh, community college, get a vocational or technical certification, or two years of a four-year university. Um, I've asked the legislature to do that. They haven't done it yet. I asked them in February, but 
I have hope springs eternal. The last thing I've asked the legislature to do is to invest significantly in diversifying our economy. And this is where we need to create jobs tomorrow. So, so um, shoot, here is our uh, economic platform in Michigan, except instead of having four legs, it's largely been balanced on one, one leg. And you cannot have a stable platform for your economy if you're balanced on one leg, and that one leg is a little bit wobbly at the moment. We need to grow some other legs to make us stable. And so what, I've, what we are going to do is to build on our strengths. So we have as a strength the automotive industry, and as I said, that's an opportunity too. We put the world on wheels. Michigan, I've said to the legislature in our effort to diversify, we should be the state that makes those wheels run on pollution-free fuel cell. We, we should be the state that produces the next generation of, of, of engine, whether it's the, the fuel cell or the hybrid technology engine. We should be the state that is focused on that as a niche, which builds on our strengths and also creates an opportunity for alternative energies. We should also build on the strength that we have in the automotive industry by focusing on high-end research and development, where the cars are, are manufactured, maybe, but where they're designed, for sure, where the creativity that goes into them uh, happens, for sure. Michigan should be the place where the global positioning satellite meets the vehicle or where the voice activated software meets the vehicle. That should be our, our niche. This is an area of strength that we need to build on. We have a life sciences corridor. We need to build on that as well. And here's an option for the economy. You know, Delphi, for example, as a company, course, builds automotive parts, but they want to diversify too. So what they've done is that they are creating a spin-off company where, you know, when you fill up your gas tank, you've got a sensor in your gas tank that tells you how much gas you got in it, right? So they're taking that sensor technology and they are using it to create medical devices which monitor your vital signs using the same kind of sensors. That kind of diversification in the auto industry is benefiting us as well. So what we need to do as a state is clearly to create jobs today and jobs tomorrow. But the challenge for me as governor, just like it is a challenge for any of your governors who are trying to lead through change, is to convince the citizens that change is a good thing that it is necessary, and that it is a requirement for us to succeed. Sometimes a message of change is really tough. Sometimes a message of change gets you in a lot of trouble. Sometimes it gets you thrown out of office. But I think you have to be honest with people about what is required and what the opportunities are. So de Tocqueville, when he was, um, uh, when he was observing America, we had the following quote, and I just love this quote, and I'm going to end with this quote because then we can have some question and answer. But what he said was, born often under another sky, placed in the middle of an always moving scene, himself driven by the irresistible torrent which draws all about him. The American has no time to tie himself to anything. He grows accustomed to change and ends by regarding it, change that is, as the natural state of humans. He feels the need of it, more he loves it, but for the instability, instead of meaning disaster to him, the instability seems to give birth only to miracles all about him. So in Michigan, it's time for a miracle. Happy to take your questions. Great. Uh, my name is Don Lambert. I'm a student here. Are you concerned that the $4,000 scholarships to all the graduating seniors are going to go to a lot of kids who don't really need the college money and uh, not enough to kids who really could use more than $4,000? Mm -hmm. Well, right now in Michigan, we have a $2,500 scholarship that goes to every child who passes what is known as our, our merit test, our MEEP test. 
And right now, and that was something that was, has been in place for a long time before I got there. So consequently, the merit scholarship today goes disproportionately to those who are more likely to go on to college as it is. So this proposal ups the ante and spreads it to every child in the state with the expectation that the message will be that every child is college material. And um, the notion, of course, there is that we want to make sure, and there's a bit of personal responsibility associated with this $4,000 scholarship. What we will say to kids is, we'll give you the full benefit of the 4,000 if you complete two years. If you need the money up front, we'll give you a 0% loan backed by that $4,000 promise. But if you drop out, you gotta pay us back. If you get to the two years, your loan is forgiven. Or if you don't need a loan, you get a $4,000 check. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Andrew Miller. I'm a student in the college. Um, Governor Schwarzenegger of California is in Shanghai right now, uh, promoting business links between California and China. What uh, economies outside of the United States do you think hold the greatest potential for engaging with Michigan over the next few decades? And what do you think the role is of you as a governor uh, in terms of promoting links between Michigan and those other countries? Right. I just got back from Japan, and I think Japan is a huge opportunity for us. Um, and I got back as well last fall from Germany. Um, I chose those two companies for Michigan because of existing businesses and partnerships already in Michigan, but also because I want to take advantage of the Japanese expertise in the automotive industry. I, um, you know, Michigan is a blue collar state and is a proud American auto manufacturer, and we want to make sure we support those auto manufacturers. But there's a whole new business model in the manufacturing and automotive world, too. It's something called coopetition, cooperation and competition together. So for example, in Michigan, two weeks ago, I cut a ribbon on a new engine factory. And this engine factory was a partnership, is a partnership between Daimler Chrysler and Mitsubishi and Hyundai, three competitors all making one engine for their three different platforms. And in this factory, just as another example of the changing nature of manufacturing, it, you walk inside, everybody's in a lab coat. It's really not a factory, it's a laboratory. And they have not hired a single person to work in this engine factory that does not have a college degree. Labor in this factory is only 3%, costs only 3% of production. So to get back to your question, I think that we need to take advantage of the global economy and not just to be victimized by it. I think it's important to invite international investment in all of the states, but I have a particular interest in one of them. And um, I want to take advantage of existing partnerships, but also reach out to areas that I know that we can benefit in. So when I went to Japan and came back, there were 10 companies who agreed to expand right away in Michigan, $116 million worth of investment. But we also want to make sure that we continue those relationships. I also did a a presentation in Osaka about life sciences because we have a life sciences corridor to build on that strength. So I think that China is an opportunity, but it's more of an opportunity for me to take a trade mission to China so that our companies here have an opportunity to export, assuming that the trade barriers remit, are, are down. And that's an issue I know in some with, with trade with China. I think that going to uh, especially if we want to get jobs here into the United States. Going to more industrialized countries to bring jobs here is an opportunity, and going to other countries that are open to our exports is an opportunity for our businesses inside of our U.S. states. Um, so there's an, there's an opportunity, but I just have to say that globalization um, there needs to be a fix with respect to the current trade arrangements in globalization. Um, I would, and I would suggest for whoever cares and is listening, and if there is another uh, presidential candidate who wants to talk about this to me, from my Michigan perspective, it would be important to see somebody talking about ensuring that trade, which we want to support, that, but that trade is fair. 
it is not just a one-way street, that we remove the trade barriers that many other countries have placed to our exports and to say that we can compete with anybody, anywhere, anytime. Our workers are the best in the globe, but you can't force them to play with one hand tied behind their back. You can't give points to the other team. And that's when you've got barriers allowed in other countries that are not allowed here. And second, our basic industries are having to compete with countries that provide health care to their companies. And so our companies have extra costs in, built into their products. There's $1,500 built into every car that you buy because of health care. $1,500. That's a huge advantage for a competitor to not have to pay that, right? So we need to take another look at the issue of health care as a competitiveness issue in this country. Because in this realm of globalization, if we want our businesses to play on a level playing field, and if we want to make sure that we foster jobs here in this country, it is critical that we at least provide some assistance with health care for those businesses. Governor, thank you for your remarks. My name is Emily Feltz, and I'm an MPA candidate here, and also an economic developer from North Carolina. Mm -hmm. We feel your pain. Our textile industry is, yeah. is gone. Yeah. Um, my question, you just actually started to address it, is about health care, spiraling health care costs, and competitiveness of our industries in the global market with uh, uh, countries that provide health care, specifically Japan, a lot of European countries. What can you do on the state level as a governor to address that? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. On the state level, it, it gets tough because we aren't, um, we aren't given the financial wherewithal to be able to pool catastrophic coverage, which I think is one answer, to do a catastrophic reinsurance pool for major industries because it gets complex inside of each state when you've got a global economy. Nationwide, I think you could do a catastrophic healthcare reinsurance pool that would lift some of the most expensive aspect of healthcare from these great job providers and allow them to compete. You know, you guys, I, I just, I can't tell you how critical this issue is from the state of Michigan, and I know that you guys, and you guys have done a great job of diversifying, by the way, so you're, you're heading in the right direction, which is what we want to do too. But this issue of healthcare, it used to be a moral issue, right, where we live in the wealthiest country in the planet and we don't provide health care to vulnerable uh, citizens or to, you know we don't provide health care to all of our citizens etc people used to say that all the time it's a moral issue but it has in the past five years become a competitiveness issue as well and I think that from both perspectives there is a huge opportunity here for us as a nation to allow our businesses to be competitive it's not just automotive it is all these industries steel paper resource based industries people who are working day in and day out and who now see the plug pulled from them because their companies are uncompetitive and let me just say one more thing about the moral issue, because I do think that there is a moral issue. I don't know how many of you have been to a Dunkin' Donuts lately. Do they have Dunkin' Donuts still here? They do, right? Okay. You know, I, I say Dunkin' Donuts because this is the last place I saw this. You go to next to the cash register, and there is like a glass jar um, with a picture of somebody's Aunt uh, Linda who needs a breast cancer uh, operation. Or did you see the story on eBay earlier this year about the parents who were auctioning off donations or begging for donations for the, lymph the leukemia treatment for their son? You know, we are not and ought not be a nation of glass jars and eBay healthcare. That to me is a moral issue. And now that we have the competitiveness basis as well, I hope that we can get public policy moved in a new direction. Thanks. Thank you. Who's up? Do I you shoot you? Right here. You're over here. All right. Jeff Roth, Kennedy School, uh, Public Policy, Urban Planning. I call Lowell, Michigan home. All and, right. Um, I knew I liked you. <laughs> you. You're coming home, though, when you're absolutely. done with all of this, oh, right? Absolutely. All right. Just I'll be making there. sure. Uh, vital to changing the Michigan economy is obviously a focus on cities and making those more attractive to young professionals as well as to business. What is your administration doing to help uh, support that? Yeah, uh, let me just tell you about something that we're doing which is very fun and cool. Um, <laughs> 
right? I talked to you guys about it earlier, but we, you know, we only have so many resources as a state, right? And you want to support making sure that you've got cities, because young people, you know, there's sort of a cycle in cities. Young people want to live where it's happening, right? Where the sidewalks don't roll up at five o'clock, where there's action, where there's music and all of that. So, so we asked ourselves as a state, what is it that we could do to foster innovation and excitement and dynamism in cities and get the local community bought in? So this is what we said to cities across the state. All right, you want to get help from us. We want you to develop a Cool Cities Advisory Committee. And in that Cool Cities Advisory Committee, we want you to put 18 to 35-year-olds. And you cannot put any politicians on it politicians are not cool and so and in that we want you to come to us with a plan of what of a, of a cool city project that would invite people to live downtown and that would make that would spark energy and excitement that would be what you would want to craft we want you to take control of reshaping your city so that it is very dynamic so we asked the cities to do that and inside of state government, we decided we were going to bust all of the silos of state government, right? Terry, Terry Takai is head of our Department of Information Technology. And we, we went to town on this. And we said to every department, what is it that you could bring to the table in providing a something for these cities. So for example, the Department of Natural Resources gives out grants for, um, for bike paths. Um, the, the Michigan State Housing Development Authority gives out grants for lofts, loft creation. The Department of Agriculture creates um, uh, farmers markets. The Department of History, Arts, and Libraries has arts grants to go to art incubators around the state. The Department of Labor and economic growth fosters entrepreneurship to give startup money to cool, um, you know, cafes or whatever. And it's not just about lofts and cafes, but with that, you know, that's a that's something that captures their mind. So, so we gave, so we we put it out there, and we had I don't know how many cities bid on it the first year. I can't even remember. There were just scores of cities that came up and had their cool cities advisory council and had all these young people saying we want to reshape our city and we want to do this. And um, we had some. Great ideas, great ideas. And we gave out 20 cool city designations and a $200,000 catalyst grant to go with each of the cities so that they could plan. And then they would have access to the state's cool city toolbox. And I know that the minute a governor starts to even use the word cool, it becomes uncool. So I'm very aware of that. So, but there was no other way to capture it. You know what I mean? I mean, how else are you going to describe it? So, so, and that is ongoing. So cities across the state have done this and are very excited about it and we want them to engage young people now has it has it has it happened overnight no but it is it is getting the local community engaged and enthused and excited and we hope that when you come home and Lowell becomes a cool city it will be because of you <laughs> it already is it already is of course <laughs> thank you hi I'm Rosemary Day I'm an alum of the MPP program and I work at the Kennedy School now um, thank you for being here. You, um, you mentioned that you're supportive of hybrid cars and yes. haven't said a whole lot more than that. The reports we get here are that the heads of the car companies are actually in Washington fighting for the old way of doing business and getting tax breaks and all that for keeping SUVs in special categories, and I could go on and on. What are you doing to work with them to move to a new way? Um, I think that the market has spoken on this and that they totally understand that when gas reaches $3 a gallon, that an SUV is not going to sell that well. Don't you think? So, I th so here's the good news. For example, Bill Ford Jr. has said that by 2010, half of the Ford fleet is going to be hybrid, which is phenomenal. And, there, and GM is going to be, I think I'm hearing, making some similar announcements very shortly. People, uh, you know, the market drives what happens. Market previously, when SUVs were selling like gangbusters in the late 90s, um, you know, that's what they were making. Now it's a different world. And they see, you know, Toyota has um, obviously specialized in this, so has Honda, and uh, the domestic automakers completely understand. They are restructuring. Uh, they're restructuring, obviously, internally to lower their costs, but they're also restructuring their market, their product line. and. Um, and they need to. 
they understand that. They've got to produce a car that people will buy in addition to restructuring internally so that they are competitive on a global basis. And uh, so I am encouraged by that, even though it's going to be a tough couple of years for the domestic automakers. But they get it. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Hi there. My name is Sarah Earhart, and I'm a public policy student here. Thanks very much for coming. You bet. I wanted to ask a question about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and I know that it's near and dear to yours as well, and that's water. I understand that Lake Michigan, that the flow of Lake Michigan has been permanently altered, and so whereas Lake Michigan used to uh, feed into the Great Lakes ecosystem and to the rest of the Great Lakes. It's now pulling water from the rest of the Great Lakes and has permanently altered uh, what is the largest freshwater ecosystem in the world. So I'm wondering what uh, Michigan State is doing to address that. I know that there have been talks about a new water act. I'm not sure what the status of those are. And I also know that there was um, an interstate compact to protect the lakes that was being developed. So I was wondering what what Michigan was doing to uh, to protect this ecosystem. So glad you asked. All right, so you know my hands up here on the mitt. Did you know that Michigan has more miles of shoreline than any state in the country other than Alaska? Did you know that? More miles of shoreline than Florida. More miles of shoreline than California. And it's surrounded by these great blue jewels, these freshwater jewels and no hurricanes <laughs> no sharks it is a phenomenal system and we are so proud of them these jewels so Michigan is known on the quarter as the Great Lakes State the resources we've got around us are the greatest resources that we have 20 years ago the state of Michigan signed a compact with the other states in the Great Lakes and the province of Ontario, that we would, the state of Michigan, pass what is known as a water protection statute to prevent our water from being diverted and going out of the Great Lakes. Now, I don't know how many of you are here from the Southwest. Anybody here from Southwestern states? You are? Okay, so you are our biggest fear. We do not want you coming, putting your straw in our Great Lakes and taking our water away. And this is why, <laughs> Don't feel threatened by that. I'm just using you as a symbol. You understand not to take it personally. Um, <laughs> but, but this is our great fear. And so I asked the legislature to pass a Water Legacy Act, a protection statute to protect the Great Lakes. Now, here, just to step back for a second, just to give you a sort of um, a description of the challenge that I face as governor. When I came in uh, to being governor, I did have a $2 billion budget deficit. We had an economy that was going downhill because of the automotive industry. We had another $2 billion worth of deficit come in to come into being. There were ongoing tax cuts that were rolling in, and so a decline in the state revenue as a result of that. And um, the people elected a very Republican legislature and a Democratic governor to fix it all. So um, it's been a wonderful challenge and a great opportunity to, be, um, to attempt to be bipartisan. The good news about this is that now that um, the water has all been mapped, according to the legislature, even though they've taken three years to do this, we are expecting that we will see incremental protection, probably not the whole ball of wax, but incremental protection by December of this great natural resource. So knock on wood that it actually happens, um, but I think people understand the preciousness of this water, both quantity and quality, and making sure that we have, we leave, a, we are stewards, we're only here for a brief period of time, right? And we are stewards, therefore, of the resources, and therefore we have an obligation. We have but temporary, a temporary possessory interest in the water and the land and the air. And that's why it's so critical that we do as we promised 20 years ago. And I'm hopeful that the legislature will in fact step up. Thank you. Welcome, my name is Joseph Werner. I'm an executive director of the Workforce Investment Board in Monterey County, California, and here at KSG, uh, taking a course called Driving Government Performance. And um, thank you very much for your support of workforce development. And I have a, a question for you in regard to the use of discretionary money under Workforce Investment Act funds. Michigan gets a couple hundred million dollars to uh, train its constituency in uh, occupations after they've been dislocated from jobs uh, that are no longer there due to closures of factories or because of foreign competition. Uh, 
since you have that discretion, what's your priority? And do you believe that uh, we can infuse more money into job training given the current finances of our country? I think that we have to. And I, I don't know, you probably were here before when I was saying that I think we need a Marshall Plan in this. And I think this is absolutely the area that we need to do it. And there needs to be more flexibility in the use of the Wor Workforce Investment Act monies, the abilities to use it in a creative way to enable people to get the training that they need. But I also think that um, every state needs to take a look at being very aggressive in pulling down as much of that as possible, especially if they have sectors of their economy that have been uh, ravaged by globalization we have uh, we've we pool all of the various investment uh, money uh, the job force training workforce training monies in the state of Michigan as I mentioned we have these regional skills alliances to do that and we use the community colleges as a great ally in doing these short-term training where people get certified on the backside but it is very clear that we don't have enough to do the training that is required for all the people who are in need and that's why I think a strategy on the federal level of being able to do that you know and I'm, uh, I have a, a bias about, about this, perhaps. I know that the federal level is in, um, sig has significant financial challenges, um, but I also think that the, the country is, has significant challenges as well, and we need to invest in our own people in order for us to be competitive as a nation and for individual states to be competitive and for citizens to be competitive. And I think that that would be an enormous uh, trade for trade. Thank you. Hi, I'm Katie Beck. Um, I'm a sophomore at the college and I graduated from Okemos High School oh, in right. Michigan. <laughs> oh, that is so excellent. Nice to meet you, nice to meet you too. Um, when did you graduate? Oh, sorry. When did you graduate? What was your uh, just your two, sophomore? Okay, so, so you're oh, oh four. Oh yeah. four. All right. N new graduate. Um, and my question is actually about education. I think the idea to give the four thousand dollar gift, I guess you would call it, um, is fantastic. Um, unfortunately, as your remarks at Rosa Parks's um, funeral show. Getting to college also requires graduating from high school, and um, throughout the state, especially in Detroit, that's just not happening as it does, you know, at Okemos or in Bloomfield Hills. And so my question would be, how are you going to get students to take advantage of that four thousand um, dollars by ensuring that they make it through the education mm -hmm. system to begin with? And what is the state of Michigan going to do to ensure that happens? We are reinventing high schools, especially in areas of great need. I'm so glad you asked that because. Detroit is an example of an urban area that is uh, struggling, but it, it, you could you could pick out a, a many other urban areas of the country that have similar issues. We need to create high schools with the new three R's, relevance, rigor, and relationship. These are the Bill Gates three R's, small high schools that are relevant to the economy and that are, that have, when I say small, that create relationships and that are rigorous. One of the other, you know, in, at Okemos, Okemos, by the way, is a great high school, um, <laughs> and um, but and I'm sure you know you obviously you're here, so you obviously did very well, but not everybody's so fortunate. And in Michigan, um, one of the things that we're doing as far as education reform in high school is that uh, Michigan, like many, uh, like some other states, we only have one class that's required in our statewide curriculum in order to graduate. One class, civics. That's it. What is up with that? So, is that, are you, are you, no, all right. So, <laughs> my other, that was just a punctuation pop, right? All right, so my other big thing is, we're gonna forget that, 16 classes for, or forget a diploma, where no one's getting out unless you know, you have to know algebra, you gotta know, I mean, only a third of the, of the districts in Michigan I mean, even though we don't have a statewide requirement, only a third of them require algebra or biology. What? That is just ridiculous, don't you think? All right, good. <laughs> glad, I'm glad you're agreeing with me. Thank you very much, whoever you are. Um, <laughs> so we are gonna, we're going to mandate a statewide curriculum which expects high standards. Now, that means high standards for every child, and every child can learn. So we have to create the environment for that child to learn where those expectations can be met and that they are expressed. Every child should be going to a college prep school. And when I say college, I'm talking about university, yes, but community college as well, or a vocational or technical certification. 
any of that will do. And to tell kids that there is a million dollar lifetime earnings difference between a high school graduate and a college graduate. And if you go to Harvard, it's probably five million. So what we wanna, what we wanna tell kids is, um, first of all, high schools have to be small, kids have to have relationship, we have to lengthen the days, frankly. Uh, that kids have to study, and we have to make sure that there is a, um, a, uh, a caring adult in their, in their life that wants to make sure that they succeed. So we have, and my, my husband, Dan Mulhern, is right here, another Harvard Law School graduate, um, <laughs> and a saint. But Dan, I point him out because he's heading up our mentoring initiative as well, called Mentor Michigan, where we're going to connect every, what we want to do is to connect needy children with a stable adult in their, in their lives. And there's a lot of kids who are born into circumstances over which they have no control. And yet, they uh, find themselves in places where nobody's telling them how fabulous they are and how much they are loved and how important it is for them to succeed. So we've got uh, the goal this year of 10,000 mentors to sign up with 10,000 kids. And that's one aspect of a way to get children moved beyond. It is, there's no doubt though that small is good with respect to high schools in those areas. How are we doing? Um, we got one, more all right, three more questions. It depends on the length of my answers, right? Hi, my name is Andrea Flynn. I work with the Women's Leadership Board here at the Kennedy School. Excellent. I was hoping you could comment on the importance of having women in positions of leadership and if you could provide some words of encouragement for young women who are thinking about running for office. Oh, that could be a whole nother lecture. <laughs> um, you know, I just, I am, um, I, there's, to me, this issue obviously is very near and dear to my heart. And I think that young women, um, like young men too, you cannot be what you cannot see. So having women in positions of authority is critical to be able to effectuate good public policy, but also to encourage other women. I say all the time that um, women ought to be like the Sherpas in the mountains of Tibet, where they, you know, they know where all of the nooks and crannies are, and they like to lead the others up to the top. You know, that once you break through a glass ceiling, you ought not just kick the ladder out and look down and say, I got mine, now you go get yours. You have an obligation to reach down and pull others through. So it is, um, it's a great opportunity once women are in positions of leadership. Women ought not listen to the voices that are often in our heads about sitting in the back row and not being the ones to raise your hand. Women have to feel comfortable stepping forward. My mom used to say to me all the time, <laughs> there are uh, three things. Don't talk about yourself. People don't want to hear it. Don't wear your good clothes every day and don't ask strangers for money. But what do you do when you're elected? All three of those things. <laughs> so, so don't listen to what your mother says. <laughs> listen to me instead. <laughs> but I encourage you and I think it's great and I hope you go forth and conquer and become, where are you from? You're from Boston. Well, it's a great place to be elected as a woman. All those, you know, show those great Irish Catholic guys what you got and, you know. All right, last question, right? Up here. Hi, my name is Audrey Kim and I'm a student at the college and she totally took my question. But more specifically, um, obviously as governor, you have a great ability to influence more than your state economy. Not that that's a small feat, but um, what words of wisdom would you give to those, not just women, but everyone who's trying to facilitate change in broader social paradigms, such as um, electing more women into office? Like, what would you change about the national effort and today's political rhetoric about women leadership? I think that, um, you know, the most, you know, here's my conservative side coming out, but the most frustrating thing for, for me to see are the messages that are constantly put out there about women um, in terms of what they should look like or how they should sound or what they should, and we're all, we're all victims of it, you know, we know that. But what drives me um, crazy 
is that uh, women are often told that in order to succeed, that you have got to be, um, you know, you have to, you know, show your midriff or you've got to, um, you know, have a mini skirt suit on. That is ridiculous. That is ridiculous. But if women are given those messages, men are given them too. So I'm interested in raising up strong daughters and strong sons that equally say that we're not going to, um, we're not going to make women an object, that women are equal partners in this, and that women, I think, need to help to reinforce that message as well. We need to tell our younger sisters that it's not, you know, <laughs> I'm not saying don't have fun, but when you enter into a work environment, you know, don't, don't be wearing stuff that is sending the wrong message about who you are. Be comfortable with being powerful, not just being sexy. To me, and do I sound like a total prude? I sound like a Republican, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I really think that it's so important for us to send a message of strength to these young, to, you know, I mean, you guys, you're going to Harvard. What a great role model you must be to young women who are looking at you. I'm serious. What a wonderful role model. You've got all these young, young people. When you go back home, where are you from? Los Angeles. You're from L.A. All right, so L.A., the, the prototype of the place that, right, that, that sends those kinds of messages. You know, when I, when I, my daughter, when my, my oldest daughter was about eight years old, we went into Target one day, and she was, she was a little tomboy. She was wearing a baseball cap on backwards, and we go up, and she is standing at the magazine racks. And, you know, it's got Cosmopolitan and Elle and all of this stuff, and, you know. And so, um, and she says to me, Mom, come over here. And so I said, what? And she said, look at this. And I said, what? She said, what is the message that's being sent to girls of my generation? <laughs> I thought, all right. <laughs> so, and now she's given me all sorts of trouble because she's 16. But anyway, <laughs> but I only say that in the best of all possible circumstances because I raise a strong daughter. And I think that we should encourage young women to be strong and not just to show the sexy side, but to show the strong side too. All right. Is that it? Thank you all very, very much. Are we done? Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. It's great to be back home here. Thank you. She's great, huh? Jennifer Granholm. Now, if all of you haven't had enough of the forum, there's another one coming at 7.30. So take a break, get a drink, come back.